please. Uh, can I just say very briefly two things? Uh, one is an apology. I have uh, a dozen copies of the 50th anniversary journal lurking at home. Um, You're lucky man. I've got a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it says, we bring them. But if you don't have a copy and you would like one, uh, do get in touch with me. You know, my email address is around and so forth. So, and I can send you one on the post. Um, I will try and remember to bring them next month when we are going to be addressed by Dr. Catherine Flitcroft from the BMC. She is the conservation and access officer, so I'm sure that promises to be an interesting talk. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, maybe. maybe. Um, I don't know whether she's going to bring the famous Henry Falkard with her or not. But uh, he's certainly a very engaging character too. So, over to you, Peter. Paul. Mary. <laughs> you remember from the 1950s, as Peter said, you came down from the northeast, you still lived in Ralston on Came into all, I think, what was cookery, and then became domestic science, and then became home economics or something. And on retirement, she went to Ghana on a number of occasions to do volunteer work overseas. We'll move on to this ramshackle collection now. Uh, Wood Cottage on the snake was reached by the Barnsley Mountaineering Club. And on this particular occasion, we uh, left the nag's head in Edale after dark and we heard a man from himself over Kinder down to Wood Cottage on the snake. And that was the assembled company, uh, not straight away, because when we rose in the morning, we realised we still hadn't got digger. <laughs> Uh, according to Colin, I think, he probably got disorientated on the way over, uh, or maybe had a few too many. He saw the lights. Saw the lights of Edo and went back. And there. went back into Edo, yeah. He slept in the bin. He slept in the bin in the pub car park. <laughs> So in the morning, Harry pretty lined us all up. And I think I got a good dressing down for not to appearing on time. The interesting thing about this, I suppose, and you'll see it in a number of pictures, is that a lot of people, when they were walking, still prefer the, prefer the old Bergen type rucksack. So we spend a lot of time on this. Now this is easily not long after he uh, arrived there. What happened was that when the Oriad Himalayan <coughs> expedition was being put together, it, uh, I remember the book, it had a forward by the Duke of Devonshire, and a lot of the arrangements for that sort of connection with the Devonshires was arranged by the agent Penrose and it was from Penrose that we found that the sawmill cottage at Heath Lee uh, could be rented and that's how we came to get hold of it in the first place. Uh, it says Jean Merritt, who I, don't, I do not remember. Stephen, Betty Gardner, John Cross, me, somebody else, Colin, and Douglas in front. Looking thoroughly bored with each other. I will move on now to what's walking 68. That was Digger. A very primitive phone box. 
man never learns to be lost. <laughs> and never admitted to be lost. <laughs> Neither was he seen with an ordnance survey map. <laughs> the rumour was that he navigated from uh, Mercator's projection of 1569. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't see him with that either. <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> He's ring, ring, ringing British Rail. One of the miles of the road he walks. So I went from Derby to Manchester on the train, out to Oldham, out to Marsden, and then maybe somewhere up the Nile. And we still see the bourbon type rucksacks in, in use. So I'm not doing all right. This is taken in the 50s in the past. In the past at that time there was a road bender's foot, a wooden construction that had been towed up there by a tractor and left there and was not being occupied. So we occupied it. And that was Fisher long before he joined the ranks of the dental brigade. In our 90, another 90. We well, had some discussion about whether this is Pinder's Rock or Jeff Coates' Pinnacle. The consensus seems to be that it's Pinder's Rock, not far from Rainster. Hanging on on the left is Walter Richardson, sometime involved in the running of Wellington Power Station. In the middle is ex president and civil engineer Brian Cook who seems to have two fingers sticking out the top of Betty's head. <laughs> <laughs> and here's Molly again, walking from Settle to Portney Riverdale. And who do we see here? Man Mountain Hayes. On a little by little on Rainster Rocks. You can see the strong biceps which never seem to never seem to get, get tired. What a splendid mountain here. You would uh, probably note the uh, type of climbing harness. <laughs> uh, a lack of any sort of head protection. Things have moved on a bit since I'm following him. Betty. In the gear of the day, rolled up trousers, stool plimsolls. <laughs> and here's Matt Mountain Jones, a member of the AM, of the MAM. He wandered across Canada during the Depression, picking up jobs where he could came back having learned to play the guitar and the bagpipes. Again you will note the climbing harness. Um, this is a man who played rugby until he'd gone 70. He could play the bagpipes. Peter James could not. <laughs> <laughs> Camp at Washington. We were on tiny campers. The white tent in the middle is an ex army mountain tent. Sleeve entry, sewing ground sheet, absolutely fine in high wind and snow. Absolutely bloody useless in the rain. <laughs> We've been trying all the time to recognise everybody. I think that's Betty on the right. I think Molly Richards is in the tent. We were not tidy campers. We're just taking in the roaches there. And if we move on one shot, we see John Wellborn, 
There had been forces in Norway before he uh, eventually got them off. And his wife Ruth, Ruth Bobka, who got out of Germany as the Germans advanced and uh, came to the DRI to train as a nurse. In the middle is John Poulter, a chap we were rather careful of because uh, he was a civil servant working in the Inland Revenue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got to know him because he was living in Burton at the time, but he moved around and eventually fetched up living in Great Longstone, where he became the leading member of the Search and Rescue Dog Association associated with the EDL team. <coughs> now this is Norman Millward doing a bit of practice pegging. I think it was about 1968. Uh, note the harness and the helmet again. And he's not far off the ground actually. <laughs> He didn't go anywhere, he was just having a go at nothing begging. <laughs> and we move now on to a proper mountaineer, Greg Jack. We call Hebel, although I don't think he likes to be called Hebel. Or our mountaineer, member of the Himalayan expedition, and uh, a very strong walker. And now we come to some of the later <laughs> ones. Scott. Now, Peter Scott's achievements are far too much for me to mention. Yeah, don't, don't all the great North Walls. Pete, haven't you? Sorry? Don't all the great North Walls? And the, the great North Walls? Which, group? Which great walls? So you've done all the All of them. All of them. <laughs> all of them. Yeah. And uh, done the North Wall of the Eye with Chris. And the uh, first ascent of Karchikun with Rob, Bobby yeah. Gilbert, yeah. Yeah. Um, Robbie Beagle, was it? Yes. Yeah, 1980. <laughs> well, who did most of it with? What's a pretty boy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh. Did a lot of climbing with me. Well, a fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not, not you with him, he was with you. <laughs> <laughs> Together. <laughs> and somebody's backside in the background, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I put this in, this was in the 60s, on Stobbine. And it's simply there because it was about the best say that I ever had. You could stand on the top, see all the way to the bottom, and just shush it straight down. Absolutely brilliant. And this is also in the 60s, I think we got up with the Ashcrofts and we went on to the band <coughs> from the uh, Colmo Gerardirette. Uh, must have been a warm day by the look of my open shirt and bare legs. <laughs> and I'm still wearing the same damn damn hat. <laughs> <laughs> Now I move on to Brinley Wern in the Pendant Valley, which we occupied from 55 to 58. On the left, in the uh, jump, we see somebody who's here tonight. There's Laura with Harry and Molly and Betty. Um, <coughs> get up, call me, right. Margaret Hooley. Down here, we see Janet Ashcroft. I'm Jim Telford Walker. <coughs> and eventually, come 1958, we had noticed to quit. And that means something about finding another place to move to. So again, it was Dave Pennington, and Lenny Phillips, and Laurie Burns, who were instrumental in searching out the place and eventually found Tanya Woodford for us. 
We've been searching valleys, they've been looking all over the place. They've been down to uh, Bob Parrish, the uh, estate agent from Team Time. And eventually, on the uh, on October the 26th in 1958, we had to move out. Now, This was the day we moved. On the right, can't see it very well at the moment, is the lorry that we managed to employ. And we'll see it a bit better here. That's the state of the lorry, with the lorry driver on top there in, in black, <laughs> and Ray Hanley on top, who was presumably up there so that he didn't have to do any work. <laughs> uh, and we see. From the left, somebody in the bushes who we still can't recognise. Uh, a chap named Leeson. The tall figure is Jim Kershaw, Fred Owen, Laurie Burns, Chuck Hooley, Seth Speed, who was not an Oreo member, and Harry Pretty's backside. Oh, we did something that would not be allowed on the road today. <laughs> how, it navi how it navigated uh, that narrow road with all that lot of, I've got absolutely no idea. On the right is Freddie Owen's Dornbill, first person I think to have one. To the right in the black is my standard companion. And Peter and I have been having a debate about what that thing is on the left with all the wood around it. <laughs> I, I think it's an old Honda. Yeah. Anyway, we went to it went. It did. It would certainly be novel by the police if we tried it now. <laughs> so we got into. Uh, Tanya Show you a picture inside. Purchase of Tanya Whistler is quite interesting. The search team had found it and we could have it, but we didn't have any money. And the president, Phil Faulkner, had raised a bit of a, a fund. But it wasn't anything like enough to uh, purchase Tanya Wood for. I think Red Squires know how much we paid. I think it was £550. So we sold that by asking people to chip in what they could. And within quite a short time, the money was raised. And then eventually, it was repaid by a sort of lottery where, as the hook piece came in, and we showed a bit of profit, and everybody who contributed had the names put in the hat each year, and two or three were drawn out, they got the money back, and it was soon all paid off. I remember the committee, me the committee meeting where we had to grasp the nettle and decide if we were going to purchase this place or not. I know exactly where it was. It was at 598 Burton Road, Derby, which was the home of the then secretary, Len Hatchett. And we decided we were going to purchase it. And the rest is history. From what, 550 pounds, you know, now able to use the building worth? I don't know, give us a guess. Anybody done the valuation lately? 250,000. Say again? 250,000. Ah. That was the last valuation. Great. And who do we see here at Christmas? Oh, that's John Fisher, John Wellborn, Becky Gardiner, somebody I don't know. Red Fan Shirt is uh, ah, Doug Cook's wife, isn't it? Pat Cook, that's right. First in the blue, I don't know. The next is Doug Cook, Mike Moore, Ronnie Phillips, and with a glass. To the lips, sitting very close to the rest of the supplies, is Meg Moore. <laughs> we now move on to annual dinners. 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but you've got all the usual suspects here. Uh, with Mike Moore. Uh, maybe at the back of Dave Rappelby's head, do you think? <laughs> In the green. Yeah, More of them still really. I've still got the sweater. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> I've still got the sweater. Yeah. Bernie Phillips, Fred Owen. I know the bloke standing up is I've got a few in the audience. What's happening? Yeah. And then came the momentous dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I think at some stage in the past, because I haven't checked the date, Carmelo O'Higgins who is a representative of the Brazilian Ladies Alpine Club, <laughs> was an official guest. A year or two later, Peter James thought that uh, perhaps he could do something about the visit. And what was said, I can't remember. If you look at the expression on Bob Pettigrew and Norrie Byrne's face, it was quite hilarious. <laughs> See Pettigrew in full flow and sitting next to him with the glass raised, the glass raised to his lips is C. C. Douglas Milner, the famous uh, mountain photographer who used to come down and judge the all out photographic meets. And um, we've got the back of Ray Hanbury's head and very good. And I move on to something different. <laughs> yeah, he's doing something with his socks. Looks as if he ought to be doing something with the elbow of his foot or his foot. <laughs> and we move abroad. We need some advice on this. <laughs> and then we have to go to Jeff again. And we do not know whether Michael. that's Peter or Michael. I think, I think it's me. No. <laughs> <laughs> you still got the shorts. <laughs> a bit tight these days. I think there must have been quite a number of children there on that meet by the look of what's on the line. <laughs> Nigger again, astronomer, photographer, with a camera that went off like a shotgun every time he used it. Margaret Hurley doing a bit of climbing, everybody had a go. Mike Moore in the 50s on Virgins. I still can't wail whether he's got nail boots on or not. <laughs> Gordon Gadsby behind the camera, Peter Jane. This chap on the right who just happens to be sitting at the back of the room now. Something happened to my body. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not really improved since then. <laughs> just one thing. <laughs> I'll just flick through these. Uh, I've no great interest. <laughs> uh, sometime in the as I recall. Who's the guy in the middle? See, that's Ray Hanley. Um. And these three <coughs> and myself decided we'd hire a boat for a day's fishing down, yeah, in, Cor yeah. down in Cornwall. And we arranged to hire this thing and showed, us, showed up on the quay at the appointed time. And the skipper arrived on his one leg. And he got up onto the roof of the cuddy, there was a hole in the cuddy, so he stuck his one leg down and steered the boat from there. <laughs> Everything went very well until the skipper decided he was going to deal with the fishing and caught a conger eel. All the people you see there plus me were trying to get up the mast there from the waves. <laughs> and of course, if you're on a boat, 
Yeah, you gotta go, you gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> you sure it was in Congaria? <laughs> The others would come along and uh, refresh us. And we're very refreshed here, but the vehicle's changed. That this doesn't cause any embarrassment, <coughs> but he's still there doing it. That's my red, I know that's my car because that's my red water container. Peter Scott, <coughs> Norman and Judy, not looking very pleased with things. He says, oh, we Valley, I have no idea what we're up to. <coughs> always present a good face to the people when you're away on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> this is somewhere in Scotland, we've got a number of these. In the middle there's a guy named Harold Rhodes, who was a mate of Ray Hansley, not of them. Oh, we'll see David again on the left. Seth Speed, Derek, and on the right is Wes Hayden. Wes Hayden on the right? Yeah. There seems to be a bit of a roots room turnout when we met. <coughs> yeah, quite a handsome fellow, one thing. <laughs> like Harry, Derek, Wes, Pete. Not too many of these. Same group. Carry on. Oh, ah. I think that must be in the Alps somewhere. The look at the colour of her face. And obviously been in quite a bit of sun somewhere. We got a nose on the left. Not you, is it, David? No. No. I'm not, sure, very proud. not sure about the next one. <laughs> and we've got Dave Pennington, Dave Pennington, Derek and Digger again. And Dave Weston, what a fine fellow. Says he is stunning. Somebody else who left us too early. <laughs> 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 this was Ray Hamley's MGB. Fast he went to Scotland in several times. I remember one particular occasion, this thing had an electric petrol pump which kept stopping. So James was out every few minutes with his high sack banging onto the rear wing to get the thing going again. And this was in Scotland. I think it was Easter, but the weather was so changeable. So we weren't prepared for pretty well anything. We weren't prepared for skiing, and for golf, and for angling. Uh, 
what we've got there at the front, apart from Douglas, are the twins of uh, Fred and Brenda Allen. At the back there with the stripe. Oh, there's two of them with stripe. Let's do the whole thing. Betty on the left, Brenda Allen, Fred Allen, Dave Pennington, Nigel Pennington, Roger Pennington. I thought you'd get a mention, Roger. Silence, is he still here? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, came the day we were camping up somewhere near Loch, Loch Inver. And uh, as we got to talk with people, on, talking to people on the site, we announced our intention of going up Sorgan. Oh, they said, never been of anything like that. Can we come with you? And then somebody else said, can we come with you? Mm. So quite a lot mob went up there, which is why that apart from Betty, I don't recognise a soul. We picked them all up off the couch. <laughs> oh dear, Cornwall maybe. Two people on the left I don't recognise any of us. No, Betty, Judy. Judith Appleby, Barbara James, Maria, who Ray Handley got involved with when he was on the way back from the Himalayan expedition, subsequently married, and in the front, Lisa Wellborn, little chap with the blonde hair is Andrew James, and on the right is Stephanie James. <laughs> I'll show you this. I'll tell you, it never did come to anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see him again in the middle there, looking rather stupid. Uh, extreme left and extreme right of the Allen twins. We have an idea that in the little maroon pullover is Gary Burgess, but we're not absolutely sure. No office again. <laughs> Nobody around that time. Oh, this is the Thursday group, or the Thursday group. Uh, having a break somewhere. Looks as like if Harry and Derek have already gone. <laughs> Move on to Beth Gallup College. With, uh, with Lisa and Helga there again, Ruth and Betty at the back, and Douglas up the pipe. That is his straight forward. <laughs> Multi generational. There are only two or three people I know on here. Uh, I'm not really expecting any offers. Tall chap with the beard is John Cross. Reggie in the middle. Reggie in the middle there, isn't he? Maybe I'm somewhere. We move on because we're not going to get anywhere. Really. In the <laughs> there we see amongst others Clive and Gene Russell. Uh, I think we've got Anne Squires there again. I don't know whether Reggie's there. Maybe bending down on the left. Let's just move on. What do we say here? Remind me again, Peter. Ken, Ken Bryan on the left. Ken Bryan, yeah. Oh, yeah. Chris. Chris Bryan. Ruth yeah. behind. Yeah, Ruth behind. John Wellborn, Douglas, Betty, Doreen Hodge, Ken Hodge, Lisa, and Treasurer, Lloyd Burns. We have one or two people here, we can see Rusty again. I think we can see Reg. We can see Oliver Jones in the front there, looking rather pregnant. Uh, the guy standing in the gate wearing the green anorak keeps reappearing, and we're sure don't know who he is. <laughs> in all sorts of pictures. <laughs> no, 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 no. What's going on here? Oh, ah. Somewhere in the Alps. 
the MG beam, MG beers managed to get there. And on the left was the Lake Cray College. Fine alpines. <coughs> that, that much gear, I can't tell. <laughs> that muffled up, I don't know who they are. <laughs> I can see Jeff Hayes. Down Ray the left, in the bottom left. With Anne Hayes behind and Dave Weston down at the front here. Okay. Is that call in there in the middle? Paul Craddock behind. And we don't know anybody else. Why Castor? And apart from raising John Cox, we see Chris and uh, College behind again, and the bloke in the green hat, right? The little bloke in the green hat is still there. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the classic. I think it might be involved with the time when Derek was president, and at his 90th birthday, somehow he managed to get nearly everybody named. I don't think you'll possibly uh, want, want me to go through them all now. But at the back with a balding head is a chap named Wacker Smith. Who, I don't think he belonged to the Orient, but he worked at Rolls Royce. Wacker was out with quite a lot. And he had quite an interesting tale to tell. One night he's leaving Derby in his van on the way to Scotland. He hadn't gone far before he was stopped. Stopped by the police, he had the back doors open, had everything out, had a good look round, loaded everything up again, sent him on his way. Got to the Brest Preston Bypass, stopped again by the police. Had everything out, had a look round, repacked it, sent him on his way. I think he was stopped four times before he got to Scotland. <laughs> that was the night that the stone of Schoon got stolen from <laughs> Westminster Abbey <laughs> uh, and they were looking for it. <laughs> Eventually returned. <laughs> <Well, laughs> there we see a very fine alpinist and a very fine fellow. North Face Man still seemed to be Flavour in the bourbon tart bookshop. Mm -hmm. Thirsty, I beg your pardon. Thursday or thirsty group. There's three people left in that group, Paul. Hey? There's only three people left in the thirsty group. Well, oh, you're gone already then, because you're not on it. Well, no, I'm talking about those that are left <laughs> now that are active. In the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it comes to Team Arthur, in which we appointed Jeff Hayes as the leader. Uh, we had a, had a McKinney stretcher and we had some uh, bamboo poles with flags on top, and we used to go out and play games about rescuing people. We used to go to a place called Broadbottom, somewhere near Stockport. And chuck this, chuck this stretcher over the edge with somebody in it. He used to send the late John Dench down, I know, as a barrel boy to guide the thing down. It's all pretty much repetitive, but they got Dave Weston. I think. Uh, Ratchet at the back. Ratchet at the back. <coughs> and hey, he's on the left. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, probably. All pretty boring stuff, all well, these Collins. Looks like a foul day. <coughs> oh, we know Paul Craddock, we know David Weston, don't know anybody else. Any offers? No? On the left at the back we have Ronnie Langworthy 
And they're both land worthy. I don't know if anybody remembers those. Peter James, Chuck Hovey. And the chap in the green anorak <laughs> is still <laughs> in the middle with a baby on his shoulder. And presumably next to him is his wife. <laughs> Well, we're outside of George at Halston Field, like it says, Dave and Lol. Those are Ronnie Langworthy. And it gets worse. Lol Burns on the left, Chuck Hooley sitting down. Uh, with the baby on his shoulder, there's still the bloke with the green hammer. <laughs> <laughs> we still go out and see Peter James, I can see Jack Ashcroft. I can see Derek. Uh, Wacker's in there, yeah, so we recorded from his uh, stone schooner at the time. Uh, yeah, we'll move on, one. Yeah. Yeah. John Tree, surely. Well, you can see it very well. <laughs> Colin at the back with his flat top on. And then we move inside Heathy Lee, fairly early on in the piece, at the time when Brian was president. Keith <laughs> <laughs> Gregson. What's funny, please? Ron's got his shirt on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's before all the alterations were done, fire was altered. Oh, the roots and so the back of the pipe. Yeah. 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 Sorry? Keith Gregson. Keith Gregson, yeah. back of the pipe. Sure. Yes, down there, we don't know. We think he might be bigger on there. Try again. Who is bottom left? It says Derek Burgess. No, 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 no. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. If you the must. A bit of money and decided you could afford to go skiing abroad. It might come as a bit of a surprise to see coming up the slope towards you a couple of Binghams. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's me? Was it Harry? Well, that was then. And this is now. <laughs> see Paul and Jean and Colin and dear Rushy behind. Well, might need a bit of prompting here again, Peter. You've got Rushy and Lisa. Yeah. Um, we think Colin bit, bit behind to Rushy, I think, is Jean. Yeah. And then. To the right of uh, Jean is uh, Margaret Foster. Yeah. Uh, and then Edith Colley Edith at, at, the the, at the back of the group. And then it's Colin yeah, it's up against the wall at yeah. the back. Basil is somewhere. Who's this lot? Ah, oh, we're getting up to date now. I may recognise some people. <laughs> First boundary walk. Key players. Ah, uh, the ones at the front. Pardon me, the ones at the front are named. Pam at the back. And Peter has some idea about the others. I think that's Jan with the one. It's Lance. Lance. Chis, isn't it? Chis? Rory. Rory. Ro oh, is it Rory? Sorry, I've got the wrong sex. <laughs> Rory on the left, at the back. I'm told that this is the first leg of the Peak District Boundary Walk. Well, this is a picture of Jan, it's the only picture of Jan that we've got. Could be anybody. Rich <laughs> don't way. You see all the well known walkers. And some other chap. <laughs> Uh, 
a former president and his lady doing something hair raising in the Alps. Mm. Used to seem to be attached to something above them. And then come to what he says here are other interests. A big cask with all the large beer barrels. You can see its dimension, seven foot six diameter, <laughs> nearly nine feet long. I got to know that quite well in the 70s. Some of my airbrain employees decided that it would be a good idea to, go, to convert it into a boat. Sail it across the channel for charity. One day when I was sleeping through my way to a staff meeting, I was accosted by personnel and said, we'll have a look at it and see if it could be converted into a barrel. I'll rephrase that. <laughs> I'm getting tired now. So it be converted into a barrel. Well, it's a barrel. It's made to roll. <laughs> it certainly, certainly rolls on land. What on earth is it going to be like rolling on water? So we set to work out of hours and eventually got a couple of twin keels fastened on the bottom to stabilise it. And I put a mounted on the back for 45 horsepower power Volvo Penta and did some trials on the gravel pits in Burton on Trent. It took us about 18 months to get it so we were confident with its performance and eventually we trundled it off down to St Margaret's Bay uh, just round the corner from Dover and set up the van. <laughs> <laughs> The crew there working from the left, uh, halfway down the halfway down the hatch, standing on the ladder. Is Ben Schofield? He's done a bit of boating, so we made him the captain. Uh, I'm sitting next with my tartan cap, and next to me, with his back to us, is a chap who was a trunker driver. Somewhere behind the pair of us is the cooper who made the thing, Bill Cook. And so we set off, it was a gorgeous day. <laughs> <laughs> Waving at all the people on the ferries, avoiding the tankers coming up channel. And eventually we fetched up on the beach in Wissan in France. We didn't have much of a contingency plan. We got an escort boat, which was uh, quite small. We couldn't have all got into it. <laughs> <laughs> we had the boat around the boat, and we had the navigator, Arthur Dorr. He'd been in the army, that was his qualification for being a sea navigator. It seemed to was navigated by lighting bags and throwing them into the sea. <laughs> anyway, we're on the beach and what are we going to do? So we looked at it and it was still watertight and the engine was still running. So we turned around and came back again. <laughs> Coming back wasn't quite so easy. We got mixed up with the foul tide and we swept down the coast a bit towards Folkestone where we stood off for about an hour and a half until the tide changed. By which time it was dark. <laughs> but we've not had the forethought to put any lights on it. <laughs> we've got a torch, which I think belongs to Douglas, so we could get down into the fume filled interior, which is full of petrol cans, to keep topping up the ready use tank. But eventually, the time tide turned and we sailed up towards the port of Dover, and we had to cross. I had to cross the access to the port of Dover in the dark with no lights on. 
And the scene's coming past like the size of box of flats coming out of the road, you know. It's like, well, we eventually got around the corner in 11 hours and 49 minutes. And the next day we were back. I think we should have been working, but we weren't. <laughs> well, the civic reception. <laughs> Went to the mayor's parlour and uh, we raised quite a bit of money. And what we didn't know is that what we raised, the chairman of the company said he would match. So we uh, made some contributions to Burton Hospital and Dr. Bernardo's. And that's what I was doing part of the time. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the audio. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say goodbye to you for somewhere on the west coast of Greenland. It's not somewhere, it's hilly sometimes on the west coast of Greenland. In front of all the little boxes made out of tiki tacky and all mm -hmm. the same. <laughs> Just had a tougher in time in the northwest passage. <laughs> May sleep a bit easier tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Anyway, uh, thank you. my brain is a bit old and my teeth are a bit worn, so I hope you excuse all that. And I hope you might have found something a little bit interesting tonight. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Paul. Are you taking any questions, Paul? Sure, whether I can answer them, I've got no idea, but do carry on. You don't mind if I sit down for a bit. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you'd uh, care to elaborate on the uh, expulsion of the Oread from fellow rock climbing huts and also no. uh, Doug Scott's <laughs> departure from the Oread. Whose departure? Doug Scott. Oh, ah, well. Something to do with some socks, I understand. Well, it probably was. <laughs> I don't know anything about the departure. Well, I was there. <laughs> All I remember <laughs> is... It's <laughs> Doug Scott. It's an annual dinner. <laughs> with his feet on the table. The man seemed to me to have no manners at that stage. Except I didn't really get on with. But I know nothing of the said expulsion. And no inside knowledge on the kippers then? On the what? The kippers. No. I've been around a long time, but I haven't been on every meet. <laughs> Anything else, anybody? No. Do you know which rugby club Oliver Jones played for? Hmm? Who did Oliver Jones play rugby for? I don't know whether these have stopped working. Oliver Jones, who did he play rugby for? Was he local? No. Birmingham somewhere. Birmingham. Birmingham. Yeah. 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 What a fine fellow. Yeah, I went with him. I went to Scotland just before I went to the Air Force. And the team was Oliver Jones, Eric Vine, Freddie Hill, female, and Charlie Ashbury. Oliver, the company director, with some money, travelled from Fort William to Malay, first staff. I, as a poor apprentice, who didn't have much money, was travelling third. Oliver had a word with the guard, and at that time I travelled all the way from Fort William to Malay, steam hauled, of course, looking out of his carriage window, which was a great big panoramic thing. That was quite a privilege. Well, if there aren't 
want any more questions. Uh, I think, uh, to <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll wind it up there. Good. Um, Paul, thank you very much. What an amazing romp through uh, all 75 years of the Oreos history. Um, so we're, we're deep in your debt. Thank you very much. Very entertaining. Some good stories and some uh, memorable photos as well. So will you join me in, in thank you. Can I just say that this thing tonight was postponed from last year when I got the COVID. I just hope you think it's all been worth waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you also to Peter for his... Yeah, yeah, yeah. asked me to say that there are some pretty albums on the table on the left there, which will be there until she leaves. Uh, I'd like to thank Paul for involving me, because it's uh, it certainly allowed me to see a lot of that which I've never knew of now. And, and Laura, of course. And I still deny any involvement in this country. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Oh, then. Yeah. 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 You did very well. <laughs> Oh, well. I was interested to see 